With so much talk about blue zones and longevity as of late, I wanted to share with you a recently published study that found that common lab tests like total cholesterol, glucose, uric acid, and others are strongly linked with the odds of reaching 100 years of age. We are talking about a study titled Blood Biomarker Profiles and Exceptional Longevity, Comparison of Centenarians and Non-Centenarians in a 35-Year Follow-Up Study of the Amoris Cohort. The OMORIS acronym stands for the Apolipoprotein Mortality Risk Cohort. This cohort has been tracked for over 35 years in Sweden. There was over 44,000 subjects in this particular cohort. Their blood tests were tracked between the years 65 of age up to their 100th birthday. It's sad to mention that only about 1.2% of these study subjects, about 1,200 of 1,200 subjects out of 44,000 subjects reached their 100th birthday in this particular study. And we're going to hone in on common biomarkers that were strongly associated with the increased odds of reaching 100 years of age, focusing on things like total cholesterol, serum glucose, uric acid, liver function tests honing specifically on GDT. There's three of these, ALT, AST, and GDT. We're going to focus on GDT. You will learn why in just a moment. But this is a really important study, I think, because I recommend you get your labs tested at least once a year or every 18 months, and you can start to look at trends. Now, the study doesn't fully elucidate the interpretations and the direction of causality, but suffice it to say, and my sort of takeaway from this study is, if we can keep our biomarkers in line with what is associated with an increased odds of reaching 100 years of age, at the bare minimum, we will reduce the odds of getting a different disease like myocardial infarction, having a heart attack, having peripheral vascular disease or chronic lung issues or uh, kidney or renal uh, dysfunction, even dementia. Because as you can see here in this table, there is a stark difference in the prevalence of underlying comorbidities in centenarians versus non-centenarians, which I think is quite fascinating. So by preventing heart disease, by preventing chronic lung issues, peripheral vascular issues, and kidney issues, and dementia, you increase the odds that you will probably make it to your 100th birthday and have good vitality during those years. If you look at the differences in underlying comorbidities between centenarians and non-centenarians, the evidence really suggests that preventing vascular issues, cardiovascular disease, will increase the odds that you will live an exceptional long life and have good vitality and maximizing your health span during those years. If you look at the prevalence of, of myocardial infarction, many of you know this is the jargonistic way to characterize a heart attack. Only 1.1% of centenarians or 30, 13 individuals that made it to their 100th birthday had a heart attack. In contrast, 2,259 non-centenarians had a heart attack, which is 5.2% of the entire cohort, which was around 44,000 subjects. Moving on to congestive heart failure. 2.6% of centenarians had congestive heart failure, a diagnosis, in contrast to 8.7% of non-centenarians. And the list goes on. Vascular disease, dementia, rheumatic disease. I think the lack of dementia in centenarians is quite poignant, important to point out, only 0.2% or three centenarians had dementia. In contrast, 1.1% or 486 subjects that did not make it to their 100th birthday. And anyone in healthcare will tell you that the number one reason why people over the age of 65 are needing assisted living and, and adult family homes and nursing homes and so forth is because they're deconditioned. They have diabetes or prediabetes, hypertension, and dementia. These are the most common conditions. They're frail, they have metabolic challenges, and their mind is gone. It's mush as a consequence of probably the underlying cardiovascular disease and metabolic dysfunction. So we're going to continue to talk about these biomarkers and review the percentage of individuals that made it to their 100th birthday and see if there's any associations with common biomarkers and the increased odds of reaching the 100th birthday. So first, I want to thank you for being here. You know what to do if you're enjoying the content. Hit that like button. Let me know in the comment section what you think, especially when we talk about total cholesterol glucose, the liver function test, GGT, as well as uric acid. Now, because we're talking about metabolic health, I just want to give you a small plug for the Myoscience Berberine Fasting Accelerator. This is a great tool to help curb those evening food cravings. We're talking about cookies, ice cream crackers, treats, the sweets that derail your sleep, that lead you to derail your uh, dietary and lifestyle habits, and actually increase fat gain in the middle because snacking before bed is the easiest way to gain belly fat, which is problematic. It junk spikes your blood glucose and triglycerides and all these things which are problematic. So if you want to help curb those evening food cravings, 
check out the Myoscience Berberine Fasting Accelerator. There's well over 200 reviews on this product. It is a great tool to help curb those food cravings. It reliably increases blood ketones, which we know have appetite suppressant effects amongst other health benefits. So you can see what other people are saying about this formulation. Using one to three capsules in the evening time to help curb those pesky food cravings that derail your health progress. Again, that URL is Myoscience, which is M-Y-O-X-E-I-E-N-C-E.com myoscience.com save using the code podcast at checkout so let's start off with cholesterol because many people might assume that high serum cholesterol over the age of 65 would increase the odds that you would die and not see your 100th birthday that assumption would be wrong in fact having high total cholesterol over the age of 65 increases the odds at least in this cohort of swedish individuals 44,000 of them, by the way, which is the largest study of its kind. I just want to mention the centenarian versus non-centenarian study looking at blood biomarkers and finding statistical associations between those biomarkers and the odds of reaching 100 years of age has never been done. This is a phenomenal study. I will link it below. I would encourage you to share this research with friends and family because this is really interesting. The scientists say, speaking on figure three here, we found that a higher total cholesterol level was associated with a higher chance of becoming a centenarian. Let me just read that one more time because I think it, this is going to take a lot of unlearning for some individuals. We found that a higher total cholesterol level was associated with a higher chance of becoming a centenarian, which stands in contrast to clinical guidelines regarding cholesterol levels, but is in line with previous studies showing that high total cholesterol is generally favorable for mortality in very old age. Now let's think about clinical guidelines because that's what these investigators wrote in this particular recollection of the facts. The clinical guidelines suggest that we should drop serum cholesterol, specifically LDL cholesterol, as low as possible because it's purportedly ostensibly atherogenic. It's going around and just attacking your blood vessels. It's highly oxidizable and so forth, which I would agree with the latter. We know that LDL cholesterol in particular, small dense LDL particles, if you eat a diet rich in linoleic acid, industrial seed oils, that might increase the propensity for LDL to become modified or oxidized, which is problematic. But it turns out that total cholesterol was strongly tethered to increase odds of reaching 100 years of age, at least in this cohort. Now, let's talk about glucose. The inverse is true for glucose. High serum glucose was strongly associated with not reaching 100 years of age. Now, this is not surprising, right? Because I just mentioned the underlying comorbidities and health issues were, were statistically higher in non-centenarians compared to centenarians are related to situations and clinical metabolic milieu and, and uh, underlying metabolic health challenges that would suggest that glucose is driving the prevalence of peripheral vascular disease heart disease, insulin resistance related complications linked with dementia and cancer, which were all higher in non-centenarians. So this is not really mentally uh, challenging. However, what does challenge my biases here are the increased creatinine and how high levels of serum creatinine are linked with not reaching 100 years of age, at least in this cohort. Because we know that serum creatinine is a marker of muscle, as well as protein intake. So the more lean muscle mass you have, the probability that your creatinine will be higher suggests that in these individuals, muscle would not be as protective as we thought. However, it could be that elevated serum creatinine levels could be a reflection of underlying peripheral vascular disease and kidney issues. So I think it's there's more analysis to unearth this association with high serum creatinine and a reduced odds of reaching 100 years of age. But I thought that was quite interesting. But let's talk about uric acid because we know that uric acid, which again is a kidney related biomarker that would suggest also a reflection of fructose intake and consumption and glucose intake. Now, there's a lot of problems linked with elevated uric acid from the pathophysiologic common sense standpoint. We think of gout when we see high uric acid. But there's also strong associations with high carbohydrate and fructose intake and high uric acid. And uric acid can be problematic. Many people have been speaking on the harms of uric acid as of late. Robert Lustig is one. We know David Perlmutter just wrote a book on uric acid, which I haven't yet read, but I would strongly c consider you read that as well. So this could be a, a proxy of fructose and glucose intake, and it could also be associated with kidney disease. So we have two kidney biomarkers that when elevated would suggest that there's a lower chance that they'll live to be 100 years of age. So it's important to protect your kidneys. Your kidneys are a network of, 
of micro vessels. And so if you have poor vessel health, because you don't go in the sauna, you don't exercise, you have blood glucose and insulin surges all the time, logic would suggest that that's problematic and that will harm your kidneys, which would ultimately lower your odds of living a, and maximizing your health span and, and having exceptional longevity. Now let's focus on a liver enzyme known as GGT, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. We've talked extensively about the importance of low GGT, how high GGT can mean one of two different things. Generally, it can also be linked with alcohol consumption, but let's focus on the most common reasons why GGT might be elevated. Well, as the name implies, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, the liver enzyme GGT is involved in the formation of glutathione. And so glut we know that glutathione is your body's most important antioxidant as well as detoxification molecule. Glutathione is an important molecule. And so if you have a high need and high demand and a high turnover of glutathione because you're exposed to heavy metals, lead, cadmium, arsenic, mercury, uh, dioxin, PCBs, endocrine disrupting chemicals because you don't eat organic food, you don't have filtered water, uh, you don't exercise and sweat out some of these persistent pollutants that are everywhere, they're ubiquitous in our clothing, in our water, in our food, in our furniture. These things unfortunately are everywhere, food packaging. So suffice it to say that optimizing glutathione status might be tethered to increase odds of having a maximal lifespan and reaching 100 years of age. Now, there's another reason why this important liver enzyme becomes elevated, and that is the presence of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or NASH, which is the complex way of characterizing fatty liver. Now, you might say, well, what is fatty liver? Fatty liver is when you have fat buildup, intrahepatic fat, fat buildup in your liver, and that's problematic. And when the liver becomes fatty, just like you know the muscle that you get at the the, the muscle meat, the flesh that you buy, uh, steaks and and ground beef and so forth from conventional uh, markets that are from cattle fed corn and soy, you know, that fat buildup happens not only in the muscle in both animals eating foods they shouldn't be eating, but also in humans eating foods they shouldn't be eating. And this happens as well in the liver, in the pancreas, even the heart. So you have this so-called ectopic lipid deposition. And so it turns out that these elevations in liver enzymes could be a reflection of underlying metabolic disease. So we have evidence to suggest that low glucose is protective. Low liver enzymes, both AST, ALT, and GGT are protective. Now, if some of this is confusing, we have our blood work masterclass, blood work cheat sheet. I will link that below. You can download that free cheat sheet. There's related videos there as well. Because unfortunately, most doctors don't run GGT normally. If they rule out that you're not an alcoholic and you don't drink excessive amounts of alcohol, they often just omit this liver enzyme test because during most mainstream medical training, that's what is taught about why GGT would be elevated is because the patient is consuming excessive alcohol. But now we know that fatty liver disease, as well as increased demand for, glut for glutathione because of persistent organic pollutant heavy metal exposure could increase the need for glutathione and thereby raise GGT. So uh, people often ask, well, how do you lower GGT? Well, starting with metabolic health, that's really the most common reason why people have elevations in their liver enzymes from fatty liver, from insulin resistance, from visceral fat, from all the, the sequela linked with metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance, uh, but also supporting glutathione health. So an acetyl glycine combination supplements are arguably the best way to optimize glutathione health naturally. In the description below in the show notes, I will link some associated products that might you might find helpful uh, for that. Now, high serum iron, as one might expect, iron can be a pro-oxidant. High serum iron was inverse, inversely linked with the odds of reaching 100 years of age. So um, non-centenarians tended to have higher levels of serum iron. I would presume that serum ferritin elevations would follow in that same uh, fashion as well. And so here's just another way to uh, sort of characterize the data. What you see here is total cholesterol. High total cholesterol was more protective than lower cholesterol in this cohort, as well as high glucose was inversely correlated with the odds of reaching 100 years of age. As we talked about uric acid, we talked about GGT and the other related liver enzymes, AST and ALT are, are featured right here. Now, I shared this on a live video on my YouTube channel, uh, and thank you for watching that if you so did. Uh, someone commented, why isn't triglycerides on here? And I thought that was quite curious and a, a very adroit comment by this individual. We're not seeing serum triglycerides. I would wager that higher serum triglycerides would be inversely linked with the odds of reaching 100 years of age because we have other metabolic-related biomarkers like glucose, like liver enzymes, that when high, 
they are associated with not becoming uh, a centenarian. Okay, so let's wrap up this conversation and talk about what the scientists or investigators wrote in their discussion. Our work to date is the largest study comparing biomarker profiles measured at similar ages earlier in life among exceptionally long-lived individuals and their shorter-lived peers. We compared the biomarker profiles of centenarians-to-be and their shorter-lived peers, investigating the association between a set of commonly measured biomarkers and the odds of becoming a centenarian and exploring how homogenous the biomarker profiles among centenarian populations were at earlier ages. We found that all included biomarkers except for ALT and albumin were predicted for the likelihood of reaching age 100. Moreover, more than one decade before their 100th birthday, centenarians had more favorable biomarker profiles than their same age peers, and they were rather homogenous. In conclusion, already from age 65 onwards, a difference in commonly available biomarkers was observed between individuals who eventually became centenarians and those who did not. Higher levels of total cholesterol and iron and lower levels of glucose, creatinine, uric acid, AST, GGT, ALP, which is alkaline phosphatase, total iron binding capacity, TIBC, that is commonly bucketed in with iron ferritin. So you get iron ferritin, TIBC, and LDH were associated with a greater likelihood of becoming a centenarian. While chance likely plays a role for reaching age 100, the differences in biomarker values more than one decade prior to death suggest that genetic and or lifestyle factors reflected in these biomarker profiles may also play a role for exceptional longevity. Our work to date is the largest study on this topic, also shows that centenarians had homogenous biomarker profiles, which underscores the importance of specific biomarker characteristics in research on exceptional longevity. So I think this stuff is just incredibly interesting, incredibly fascinating. There's a really popular Netflix series now talking all about blue zones. Dan Buettner is going around to different parts of the world, Okinawa and Sardinia and so forth, and interviewing these people, seeing how they live and characterizing their lifestyle, finding they have different meaning, purpose, sense of community. They're very athletic. They move around. They're mobile. They don't have dementia. They're not deconditioned. These are active people that garden. And I think it's important to recognize that we now have data finding very simple associations with common biomarkers that, that are improvable. You can improve upon your serum glucose. You can improve upon your liver function tests. You can reduce your uric acid. And logic suggests that if you can improve the underlying health characteristics that would cause these biomarkers to be elevated in the first place, you would also then improve your health. And so that's why I made this video. Hopefully you found it helpful and gleaned some insights from that. I will put this article in the description below. As always, I'm thankful that you tuned in all the way. Thanks for hitting that like button. Thanks for sharing this video and we'll catch you on a future one down the road.